Amen. Amen. Let's give God a praise on tonight. Amen. Thank you. Thankful for the prayers of the saints. Thankful for everyone who's here. As Brother Stephen mentioned, let's be in prayer for those who are ill. Sister Miller is here, and Sister Barbara Evangelist Wade is ill. Uh, also, Sister Teresa Johnson, <clears throat> as well as her grandbaby. Xander, both of them are a little ill. So I think it's something that's going around. So we're going to be in prayer. God will continue to add healing typically around this time of year. <clears throat> typically around this time of year, change of weather. Uh, we have these things, so we ask that, 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 that God gives us strength, especially when it's changing weather and it's uh, going from 30, 40 degrees to 70 degrees. A lot of things happen. It's hard for those uh, bacteria and illnesses to die. So we're going to pray that we survive through this. And God's going to give us strength. Amen. Exodus chapter 12. I'm going to read <clears throat> for our text two passages of scripture. For once we'll take a thought on tonight. Grateful for this Wednesday midweek. Refueling. <clears throat> it's a very familiar text tonight. Exodus chapter 12, reading verses 12 to 14. I'll read it as you follow with your eyes. Give me a chance to get there. It's the second book of the Bible, Exodus <clears throat> chapter 12, verses 12 to 14. I have it. It reads this way, For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night. I will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt. I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. The plague shall not be unto you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. And this day shall be unto you for a memorial. And you shall keep it a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. You shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. And I want to talk today about the power of the blood. The power of the blood. And we're going to talk a little bit. We're going to start just as an introduction <clears throat> to understanding Exodus. You have to understand uh, the latter part of Genesis. In fact, whenever we're looking at any of the law, all of those books are so intertwined that there are stories within the story see the book of Exodus, the word Exodus just means to exit or to evacuate. So, when you look at the book of Exodus, Exodus evacuate from where? The primary theme of that book is detailed in getting out of Egypt. And when we look at it in the context of studying the scripture, Egypt is always a type of or a symbolism for the world or worldly system. So when we talk about God bringing out of Egypt, but literally saying him, bringing the church up out of the world, bringing his people up out of a worldly system. <clears throat> so oftentimes we'll refer to uh, many systems where Israel was in captivity. Uh, we'll speak of that nation as being symbolic of sin or a sinful nation. So we'll speak of Egypt this way, we'll speak of Babylon this way, we'll speak of Assyria this way. And we oftentimes talk about how God brings out of, brought them out of Babylon, brought them up out of Egypt. And I told you before, when we look at it related to the Greek word church, ecclesia or ecclesia, that is a twofold word, ek and klesia, ek meaning out of, klesia coming from the word kaleo means to call. So when we talk about the church, it's literally saying we are the called out ones, the ones that God has brought up out of. <clears throat> so when we're looking at the 
the study in, in, in uh, Exodus, we're seeing literally his church being brought up out of Egypt into a land that he had promised before in Genesis. <clears throat> so for us, for us to even get a proper understanding of Exodus, we have to look at Genesis. We have to look at some of those characters. And we look at Abraham, we look at Isaac, we look at Jacob, we look at the promises that God had given to Abraham. And then we trickle it down into one of Jacob's sons, uh, Joseph. We find that the latter part of the book of Genesis ends with the life of Joseph. Most of us know the story of Joseph. <clears throat> Joseph uh, being this very interesting figure, he was one of the, one of the youngest. Uh, oftentimes we say he was the youngest, <clears throat> but he was not the youngest. Benjamin was the youngest. In fact, Benjamin was 10 years old, around 10 years old, when Joseph was sold into slavery. Joseph was around 17 years old. So he was one of the youngest, but he was not the youngest. So make sure that, that, that our Bible history is correct there and knowing that. <clears throat> but he was nonetheless, as scriptures tell us, the favorite. And he was the favorite among his father. We talked a little bit about this. Uh, to be favored just means to be <clears throat> preferred over another. Tell somebody to be favored is means to be preferred over another. So Joseph was preferred over all his brothers. He had a, J Jacob had 11 others <clears throat> to choose from, but Joseph was the one preferred. And we find here, so we pick it up here <clears throat> in Exodus. We find the end of Genesis. It's, it's after the famine. The famine, great famine came in the land. Joseph helped to deliver not only his family. I think it's interesting because we talk about him being able to deliver his family from the famine. But the more significant thing is he was able to de deliver an entire nation, Egypt, from the famine. You know, we talk a lot about the family, uh, but to uh, to save an entire nation, that's pretty significant. <clears throat> so the entire nation was under famine. He was able to be used to deliver Egypt and his family. Jacob's father, at the point where we're reading now, his father had died. All of Joseph's family was left in Egypt. His brothers were fearful now that Joseph was going to take vengeance. Because if you remember the story now, Joseph went through this tumultuous situation where his brothers, first of all, thought to kill him. And they conspired and they set a plan, we're going to kill him. And then something along the line, of, I want to say the spirit of the Lord, uh, fell upon one of his brothers. And he, just, he decided, let's not kill him, let's sell him. <clears throat> so they decided to sell him. Joseph goes through all this turmoil. Now, he being the hero that God allowed him to be, delivers the nation and his family from the family. Now, his father dies. So the brothers are fearful now. Joseph going to kill us now. Because not only is daddy not here to keep him in check, Joseph is a pretty powerful man in the kingdom. So if he says to Pharaoh, kill him, we all did. So now they're in a situation where they're afraid of him. So let's turn to Genesis chapter 50, verse 19. <clears throat> and start there. Genesis chapter 50, verse 19 through 21, we'll read. And it's interesting how Genesis 50, 50, 50, I'm sorry, 50, 5, 0, my, my, my country twangs sometimes, it makes it hard. Genesis 50, good, 50, 19. And Joseph said unto them, Fear not, for am I in the place of God? This is a rhetorical question he's asking them. Fear not, now, am I God? I can't take your life. Should, should I be able to take your life? I'm not God. Verse 20. But as for you, you thought what? Evil against me. Stop there. When he's talking about thought, it's not just contemplating. Hear this word for thought in the Hebrew means to actually devise a plan, actually develop a plan. You, you developed a scheme uh, against me that was evil towards me, but God, what, meant it unto good to bring it to pass as it is, what, this day to what, save much people a lot. Tell your neighbor the intentions of others are of no consequence. Let's say it one more time. The intentions of others are of no consequence. Sometimes we focus more on the intentions of others than we focus on the intentions of God. 
and we get all up in arms and we get all hurt and we get all broken because how could they do this to me? But the intentions of others are of no consequence if you focus more on what's the intentions of God. Because sometimes when you're going through a difficult situation, it's not the devil. Sometimes when you're going through a difficult situation, it's the intentions of God. And the intention of God sometimes is to take you to a purpose that you don't even see yet. Sometimes, and this, this may mess you up here, sometimes, tell your neighbor, your purpose is not just your gift. Oh, y'all not here. Sometimes when God gifts us, we think that's our purpose. Yeah. God's blessed me to be a singer. God's blessed me to be a preacher. God's blessed me to do this. And that's my purpose in life. No, that's the vehicle to possibly get you to your purpose. But we have looked at our gift as being our purpose. So what we have to look at is ask God, God, what's the purpose that you're going to draw through my gift? Oh, y'all not hearing me. So in this situation, Joseph's dreams was not Joseph's purpose. His dream was the vehicle that guided him to his purpose. The intentions of his brothers were not what God was going to use to kill him, but the intentions of his brothers were going to bring him to the point where he had arrived this day. He said, now, God meant it for the good to bring it to pass as it is this day to what? Save much people alive. Tell your neighbor, if I got to go through a little bit to save some people, oh, y'all not going to hear me. Uh, oh, oh, oh. Uh oh, that, that test that you're going through right now, if I gotta endure that job that, that, that I, that I can't stand waking up in the morning, oh man, if I gotta endure them people talking about me, oh God, if I gotta endure losing some stuff, if I gotta endure losing some friends, God, if I gotta endure this sickness, Lord, just to be able to save some people, oh, oh, can, can you be that benevolent that you're not so much worried about yourself, but you worried about the people that you would save? I'm always astonished by those who are in uh, heroic positions like the fireman or the police officer uh, and a fireman that would run into a burning building just to save somebody. Are you that way spiritually, the way that, that I'll run into harm's way, into danger, into the worst neighborhood, into the worst environment, into the worst situation just so that I can snatch some people up out of hell? This is what Joseph was saying. He's saying all of this was the intention of God. So the intentions of others are of no consequence. You might have meant it for evil. You might have meant it that I die. You might have meant it that my name was ruined. You might have meant it that my reputation is ruined. You might have meant it that everything else that I had going for me that I would lose, but God had a different purpose. Tell your neighbor, you better get in line with God's intentions. Because when you get in line with God's intentions, then you're able to fulfill your purpose. You meant it for bad. Understand, not only was he a dreamer, but Joseph had a gift within a gift. Tell your neighbor, he had a gift within a gift. Yeah, the scripture tells us not only was Joseph a dreamer, but he had the gift of interpreting the dreams. Oh, yeah. You know, it's, it's one thing to be to have one gift, but have multiple gifts. I'll submit to you three, three reasons why he was hated. He was hated, number one, because he was favored. He was hated, number two, because he was gifted. He was hated, number three, the scripture tells us, because he was young. Sometimes it's dangerous being young, gifted, and favored. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Everybody's not going to like you when you're young, gifted, and faithful. You know, I, I've experienced that before. I've experienced that in ministry. Early on in my ministry, when God was working and using me, not everybody was happy that I was young, gifted, and faithful. Yeah, I had people try to try to block ministry opportunities. Oh, he too young. Oh, he too young. I, I've been in this for 50 years. You think he's going to just walk up in here year one and be able to do what I did? Had to work for 50 years? You know, the church sometimes has it backwards. You know, I never forget when, you know, uh, when Kobe Bryant came into the league. When Kobe Bryant came into the league, the, the oldest uh, active player was Robert Parrish. You know, he had been there, what, 30 years? Somewhere around there? 
But at his 30th year, Kobe was better than him at his first day. So do we look at Robert Paris that's been there 30 years and give him credence, or Kobe Bryant, who is a perennial all-star, who would go on to be a multiple championship basketball player, Hall of Famer, future Hall of Famer, would we give more credence to the person that's been there 30 years just because he's been there 30 years? Or would we give it to the one that's the most gifted? Sometimes the church, we have it backwards. But the world system will say, I'm going to give it to the one that's the most gifted. So sometimes you're hated when you're young, favored, and what? Gifted. Tell your neighbor, don't worry about people hating on your gift. Because you got to understand, you got to focus on the giver of the gift. And the giver of the gift is God. And when God gives you a gift, he never gives you a gift to just sit there. God doesn't gift us to sit us on the shelf. God gifts us to fulfill purpose. So it means when he gifts us, he has a specific reason why you're here. You have a specific design how you were created. You're the way you are because God created you that way. And the, the focus is to figure out, God, how do I harness the way you've created me to fulfill my purpose? Stop trying to change yourself so much. And when I say that, I say that loosely because obviously we do have to have introspection and there are some things that we need to change in our lives. But sometimes God will use your personality trait, the way you think, the way you're wired for his glory. When he, when he, when he, when he filled and he, and, he, and he anointed Peter, he didn't change Peter's boisterous nature. No, Peter talked too much. All throughout scriptures, all throughout uh, the gospels, Peter talked too much. He was impulsive. He, he was very vehement and very demonstrative all throughout scriptures. When God changed him, he did not change that trait. He changed how he used it. He changed how he harnessed it. That same boldness was the same boldness that Peter stood up on the day of Pentecost and say, this same Jesus whom you crucified is both Lord and Christ. Repent ye every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ. Be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. He used what he was created Paul persecuted the church. When he's converted, God didn't change him. Right? He used his same analytical thinking. He used his same uh, zeal for the word of God and knowledge and thirst and hunger. And he used it for his purpose. Sometimes we allow people to change us and change things that God has placed in you for a reason. So the key is, God, how do I do this and not be a distraction? How do I use my personality? not be a distraction? How do I use the gifts you give, give me and not be a distraction but let it be for your glory? Yeah. If you've made me an analytical thinker, instead of questioning you, God, let me question other things. God, if you made me bold and talkative, instead of talking and gossiping and, and spreading rumors and doing all this, let me be talkative and spreading your gospel. When God places those things in you, he's placed it in you for a reason, and sometimes the devil will distort it. He will take over your gift and use it for wrong. But yet, Joseph here, he didn't allow the hate to change how he operated in his gift. Sometimes we allow hate to change how we operate in our gift. If people ain't receiving us, if people don't like it, if people are talking about it, we'll withdraw instead of keep doing what we're doing. You know, we read these scriptures and we see Joseph. We, and, 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 and I have to tell you, sometimes as I read, I was like, you know, why Joseph going to just be quiet? Because every time he talk, he he just making them mad. Every time he tell them these dreams, I, you know, I, I'm going to grow up and I'm going to be over y'all. Yeah, he's telling them. And we've heard preachers say to us, you know, stop telling people your dream. God gave you that dream and you... You, you telling everybody the dream, and it, it don't matter if you tell them or not. They're going to hate you because you're gifted and because you're famous. Joseph didn't let how people treated him change the way he operated in his gift. If consequences come as a result of me operating in the gift that God has given me, let the consequences come. If people going to hate you for preaching the word of God, let them hate you. You preaching soft gospel ain't going to change nothing. All you've done is worsened it. Instead of them being mad at you, he mad at you. 
And it ain't nothing like God being displeased with how you're operating your gift. What do I care about you rolling your eyes? If God is pleased, if God's smiling, why do I care about your eyes? But it's when we change to please man. Ne tell your neighbor, it, it, I want to free you, I want to help you, I want to give you something that you can take from now into glory. Never, never, ever, ever fashion how you operate your gift to please people. Your focus should always be to please God. And if they're pleased in the interim, God bless you. But never fashion how you operate in your gift to please people. Because people are fickle. Yeah. Yeah, people, do you realize within a seven-day span that they they were saying Hosanna in the highest and fanning him with palms? And then the next seven, they were saying, crucify him, give us Barabbas? People change on you. Just like that. They like you. To, uh, another thing, within your gift, never be the flavor of the month. Yeah, never be the flavor of the month. Don't let people put you on that pedestal. I tell I tell a lot of young preachers that all the time. You know, people calling you, they got you preaching everywhere, and you don't think, oh, I didn't arrive. No, you, you, you just the flavor of the month. And then when the next one comes that they like, your phone gonna stop ringing. That's why Paul told Timothy, be instant in season and out of season. Oh yeah, y'all don't hear me. Sometimes you're gonna be hot. Sometimes people gonna gonna love what you do, and sometimes people ain't gonna even be checking for you like that. Be instant in season, out of season. And in those season and out of season, do what? Reprove, rebuke, teach, preach, do all this. Do what you're doing, whether you hot or not. And this is what Joseph did when he was with his brothers. This is showing when he was with his family, he operated in his gift. When he got to Potiphar's house in the workplace, he was operating his gift. When he got in the prison, in a time of calamity, he operated in his gift. When he got before Pharaoh, among the most elect person in the whole entire land, he operated in his gift. It didn't matter what place, what setting you put him in, he operated in his gift. What is your testimony? Will you operate in your gift when you're on cloud nine, and then when you're in the valley, you just somewhere reluctant to operate in your gift? Is your gift dependent upon your personality? Is your gift dependent upon how you feel that day? Is your gift dependent upon how people receive you? Is your gift dependent upon whether you're not in, whether you're in front of dignitaries or not? Will you still preach the word of God no matter who's around you? Sometimes you got to give do a gut check. Sometimes we change depending upon who we're around. You know, I, I call them convention saints. You know, when, they, when they're here on Sunday morning, they got one personality, but when they're at the convention, they don't necessarily know you. Yeah. Praise the Lord. God bless you. We go to the same church. Because some people change depending upon the setting and depending upon who's around you. But if you could be consistent whether you're in front of the presiding bishop or a lay member, God will bless you. Because God doesn't like us flip flop. He wants us to be as consistent as Joseph was. Joseph was this way now. Moving along. Joseph died. The scripture tells us in Genesis 50. I'll paraphrase it. He died at the age of 110 years old. He died, but before he died, God blessed him with two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. And because he blessed him with these two sons, and because of the sacrifice of Joseph, the Bible said that Joseph was able to see even to the third generation of Ephraim and was able to see Manasseh's son that came to his bedside. So he was able to see not only his children, but his children's children, even down to the third generation. But he died, and when he died, he left a promise. Let's go to Genesis chapter 50, verse 24 through 26. <clears throat> giving you a whole lot of background for for this story <laughs> Genesis 50 24 and Joseph said unto his brother I die I'm dying in other words and God what will surely visit you and bring you what out of there it is again up out of this land 
into the land which he swore to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. So Joseph was, was reciting to them and reminding to them the promises that was given to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, these great patriarchs, right? All right? And Joseph took an oath of the children of Israel saying, God will visit you. Now, how, how am I going to give you my word and I'm dying? Wow. I'm giving you my word, but I'm dying. I'm making an oath, but I'm dying. Most people will look at that and be like, that don't really amount to nothing if you die. Why is it? Why was it so important? Because he wasn't giving them his oath. He was giving them what God had said. So he was dying, and in his dying, he was giving them God's word. So the oath that he was making, he was just reminding them and reciting what God had already said. My oath to you is just the word of God. Tell your neighbor, I can't promise you nothing but the word of God. The only thing that's going to really stand true is the word of God. I can give you my word, and we can say my word is my bond, but my word can change. So the only thing that's consistent that I can give you is the word of God. The only thing we can pass down to our kids, the only thing we can give to our family, the only thing we can give to the lost and the dying generation is the word of God. So the oath that he was making with them was the word of God. I promise you that he's going to visit you. Surely he's going to visit you, and he shall what? And ye shall carry my bones, what? From hence. All right, don't let me die right here. Carry my bones with you. Don't let me, don't leave my, my bones in Egypt. All right? Because I was here and the Lord used me in Egypt, but this ain't where I'm supposed to be. I'm coming up out of Egypt. So when you come out the world, y'all take me out the world too. That's what he was saying. All right? Verse 27, what did he say? <clears throat> mm-hmm. All right, stop there. We don't have to go to 27. We can stop there. That's great. So he died. So when he died, let's go to Exodus chapter 1. We there? All right, Exodus chapter 1, verse 1. Uh, we'll fast forward through that. Let's go to verse 6. Exodus 1 and 6. Good. And Joseph what? Is repeating to us again what it said in Genesis 50. I told you it's the bridge between those two. In order to understand this Exodus, we have to go back to Genesis to get the story before that. So here we are in Exodus. It's picking it back up. Exodus 1 and 6 says, And Joseph and what? All his brethren and... Wow. So the time has transpired now. He dies. All his brothers die, and all of that. So that means all of Joseph's sons, right? They all die. So Ephraim and Manasseh, they're dead now. The grandkids, they're dead now. That whole entire generation is gone, right? All right? Then what does it say? <clears throat> and what? Wow, so now everybody's dead that was in the older regime. And now we have a new crop of people among them that are their predecessors. And the children of Israel were fruitful and what? In, increased what? Abundantly. And what? And what? Stop there. Most of this sounds like they just grew as a people. Right? But there's a difference. Understand when Genesis, when he created man, he told him what? Be fruitful and multiply. Understand we've looked at that and just, we just thought that just meant to have babies. Right? But look at it in this greater context when it's saying being, be fruitful and multiply. One, two things he's saying there, two commandments. One of them, he's taking care of for you. The second one, he's asking you to do. So when he says be fruitful, it's talking about the fertileness of the womb and the health of the seed. So when he says be fruitful and multiply, he's talking to your body and saying be fruitful. All right? You can't be fruitful by yourself. You can't make your womb healthy. You can't ensure that your seed is going to germinate, right? So 
twofold when he says be fruitful and multiply. Be fruitful, he's commanding that now to you. You be fruitful. I've created everything that you need to bring forth. So now I'm commanding you to be fruitful because you have everything that you need in you. So I'm commanding you to be fruitful and now take what I've given you to be fruitful and multiply. So tell your neighbor, you have no excuse because everything you need to bring something forth, say it, is in you. And not only is it in you, he's already spoken, say, be fruitful. Be fruitful. So the second part of it is to be multiplied. So because of that, now we see Israel was fruitful. They were fertile. They didn't have any deadness in their womb. Remember Sarah? The Bible says that she, her womb was dead. But he still brought forth in a dead situation. But Israel, during this time, that wasn't their problem. They were fruitful. They didn't have no deadness in their womb. And because of that, it says they increased abundantly. This increase abundantly means that they were able to have an abundance of everything that they needed. And then they were able to multiply. All right? And not only that, they waxed exceeding mighty, meaning that they were strong. So the land was filled with them. So we see that. We see all this stuff that's happening to them. Verse 8. Now they're what? Who what? Now wait a minute. Wait a minute. You mean to tell me that this great hero saved our entire nation from famine? And you ain't at least heard of him? English doesn't give it any context. Go to the Hebrew. The Hebrew does not say here. It's not interpreted that he did not know him. It's interpreted that he refused to acknowledge him. Yeah. Wasn't that he didn't, hadn't heard of him before. He refused to acknowledge him. There arose up a new king that refused to acknowledge Joseph. All right? So when we see it here, he knew him. He just refused to acknowledge him. But the interesting thing here, the Hebrew word here that we have is yada. Anybody want to know what yada is also used for? It's a praise. It's an acknowledgement. So yada, how they would display it, yada would be to extend the hand toward God as if I acknowledge you. So in this instance, when it's talking about Joseph, there arose a pharaoh that refused to acknowledge Joseph. All right? Knew not Joseph. All right? So because of that, he made a plot. Verse 9. And he said unto the people, Behold, the people of the children of Israel are what? Wait. Wait. So you mean to tell me God has already commanded them to be fruitful? He's put everything they need in them to go forth. They multiplied, like he said. They increased in abundance. They became a mighty people. And even Pharaoh himself acknowledged they're more mightier than we. But yet, verse 10. Um, verse 10. And fight against us. Now, isn't this interesting? They're already mightier than Egypt. But yet they're about to fall into slavery to Egypt. They're already mightier than Egypt. But they're about to fall into slavery into Egypt. They're already mightier than Egypt. But they're about to fall into slavery to Egypt. What we missed here. What did God promise Abraham? What did he promise Isaac? What did he promise Jacob? And what did Joseph promise the people of God? That surely I make an oath to you that God will allow you to come up out of 
the land. He didn't tell them how he was going to do it. But did not Pharaoh just now confess to them, get these people up out of... Y'all going to be Bible students with me today? So sometimes your way out is going through. I just lost half the audience here. Y'all didn't want me to teach this like this. But God is showing us in this scripture, Israel's way up out of is to go through it. I can't, I can't, I can't get you to Canaan without allowing you to go through Egypt. I, I, I couldn't, I couldn't bring you to be this sanctified, holy saint that you are right now without allowing you to go through some stuff in the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All that wilding out, all the stuff that you did, and all that self-destructive behavior. You know, I did some of that stuff just so that I can bring you up out of it to get you to your promise. Uh, I, I did that for a reason. I did that for a purpose. I allowed these these taskmasters to be assigned to you. I allowed this persecution to you. Let's go to verse number eleven. Therefore, did they set over them taskmasters to afflict them with their burdens. And they what? Built for Pharaoh treasure cities, Pithom and Ramesses. All right? Let's stop there. So after they did this, which is interesting because we're already outnumbered. We're already stronger than them. But somewhere along the line, God allows us to fall into these conditions. Somewhere along the line, God, this ain't adding up. How is it that I'm being held captive to people that I'm better than? Oh, y'all, man. Some, some of y'all working on a job and got a manager that you're smarter than right now. And you like, God, how in the world am I working under this individual? You know, I just want to say it nice, this individual. Because sometimes before God really takes you to the place that he wants you to be, he'll allow you to go through some stuff that don't make any sense, that, that, that looks contrary. God, how can you say you're with me and I'm going through so much? God, how can you say you're with me when, when it just looks so crazy? God, how can you say that you're with me when it looks like I'm losing? Anybody ever been that way before? God, how, 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 you know, God, how can I really testify that you're a great God when it looks like I'm losing in this battle? It seems like every week there's something. It seems like every day I get bad news. It seems like every time I take a step forward, the, the, the pressures of life just push me back ten paces. And, and how is it that I'm going through all of this, but yet I'm supposed to shout with victory and say that I'm a child of God, yet I'm supposed to lift up my head and be excited and glorious to be a child of the king when I'm in bondage in Egypt. They had all kind of taskmasters that were on them. They went through so much uh, that the Bible says that the more that they afflicted them, God still allowed them to multiply and grow. What you don't realize, for some of us, sometimes you got to count your blessings. And the more that you're afflicted, the more that you're bruised, the more that you're wounded, if you really start to count those blessings, you say, God, I'm more blessed now than I was before I was going through this. Anybody ever been that way before? I'll, I'll tell you, I've been unemployed before and been more blessed eating at better restaurants and, and doing more leisure stuff than I did before. And I'm like, God, how in the world? Because this don't really make no sense. But I dare you to tell your neighbor, the more that they afflict you, the more that you're going to multiply and... Understand, man adds, but God multiplies. So with God's growth, it's not one plus one equals two. God grows exponentially. So God will give you two, and out of the two, he'll give you eight. And then out of the eight, you'll have 32. And then out of the 32, you got 64. Out of the 64, you have 128. And God grows that way. You're looking for God to add a little bit here, add a little bit there, give me a little bit here, give me a little bit there. God say, I will blow up your world. I will completely take you from being broke to rich. I'll take you from being ignorant to, to having a wealth of knowledge. I'll take you from having no power to being the most anointed thing on your road. Why? 
Why? Because I don't add. I multiply. I give you exponential growth. Anybody need God to do some stuff and you say, God, I need you to grow me leaps and bounds. I ain't got 10 years to wait and waste time. God, I need you to do it now because, God, if you don't grow by multiplication, I'll never get it. Yeah, some of us. Some of us too far behind. So Some of us too behind the curve for God just to add a little bit. Some of us ha- have wasted too much. That's why he said, I will restore to you the years that the canker worm has stolen. Not the minutes, not the seconds, not this little day-by-day stuff. But I will restore to you the years that the canker worm and the palmer worm and that caterpillar and the great army has sent you. We talk a lot about the, the, the canker worm, but we don't talk about all of those that he, that he talks about, when you talk about all of those that he talk about, it's basically giving you three different types of creatures. And these three different types of creatures, one comes and eats a little bit, the other comes, eats the rest, and then the other one comes and eats the rest that remains. So he's saying, I sent three great, uh, this great army, three different entities to just eat away at you a little bit at a time. And what this didn't take, I sent this to take. And what that didn't take, I sent that to take. And it deteriorated stuff over a period of time leaving you with nothing and for some of you you've been going through that one problem comes and takes a little bit of your joy so another problem comes takes a little bit of your joy another problem comes takes a little bit of your joy and you're standing there with nothing and God is saying that's exactly where I want you to be because when you're there that's when I can bless you with more and I'm going to restore the years that they have stolen from you I'm going to give you the former rain and the latter rain in one month. Something that takes you three months to get. I'm going to do it all in one month. I'm going to rain on you and give you a surplus that you've never seen before. The Bible says, because they went through all this, we know the story. Moses, he arises. God allows him Pharaoh made a decree to kill the firstborn, the firstborn of every house. They went through trying to kill these babies. Moses was spared, ended up finding his way in Pharaoh's house. What we don't really look at is Moses was from the tribe of Levi. He was of a priestly descent, or what would have been, what would become of a priestly order, because the priestly order, as it related to law had not been established yet because that would be later established through his brother Aaron. But he was an anointed young man who was sent for a purpose to deliver the people of God. He was raised up in Pharaoh's house. He goes from Pharaoh's house and we know the story. He becomes a second in command. He becomes second in command there but when he finds out that he is a Hebrew and he sees an Egyptian kill a Hebrew, the Bible says that Moses did something uncharacteristic murdered this Egyptian and hid him in the sand. You know, we talk a lot about the anointing of Moses. We talk a lot about how God raised him up and how he got the law and how he took his staff and he parted the Red Sea and how God used him to take his staff and when he held it in his hand, it was a staff. And when he threw it down, it became a serpent. And when he picked it up, it became a staff again. We talk about all the anointing that came within Moses, but we don't talk a lot about a murderer, he ran, he was a coward, he fled the scene and left for 40 years in the land of Midian, so we pick it up in this story that he goes to Midian, stays there, hides for 40 years, changes how he looks, changes what he does, uh, totally away from the palace, and God calls him, let's go to Exodus 3, verse 2 through 6, Exodus chapter 3, so he's, he's done the unthinkable act, he's become a murderer, somebody that we wouldn't even want around us, some that we wouldn't think would be characteristic of somebody that's going to be used of God. Why? Because he's done this unthinkable act. He's done this thing that nobody would have expected him to do. He's done this thing that we would have thought, you can't bounce back from being a murderer and God using you to deliver his people. You can't bounce back from, from doing this grotesque thing. Not only did you murder this person, but you hid the murder. You hid this person in the sand. You knew what you did and then you led the scene, and you were gone for 40 years, but yet God still said, I'm going to use you. Exodus 
Genesis 2, 3, verses 2 through 6. And it says, And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in the what? Out of fire, in the midst of. And he looked and what? And the bush what? And Moses said, And see. And what? When the Lord saw, mm -hmm. <clears throat> so when Moses when Moses changed his character, he, he used to run in his flames. But this time he said, "Let me see what this going to be." Now, the scripture said that the angel of the Lord came unto him first, but then when Moses looked, it said, "What?" Then the Lord came, and God said, "Oh, y'all not hear me." Uh, 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 sometimes your actions can draw God to your place. Oh, y'all not going to hear me. Did, did not the, is that not what the scripture said? Did not the, the scripture says in verse 2, and the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in the midst of the fire. Then we drop down to verse what? Verse number 4, and it says, and when the Lord saw that he turned to see, God called him. So what changed? 